I'd like to call the regular Board of Ed meeting to order at 7.04. Um, the invocation or moment is silence by Dr. Kelman. Uh, I'm sure that everybody is looking forward to the holidays. Uh, this is the most joyous time of the year. But uh, before we begin our work for this evening, let's take a moment of silence to remember those who died in the terrible tragedy at Sandy Hook. Thank you. I pledge allegiance. Fire evacuation announcement. There's double doors in the back. You can head out that way and head out to the grass, or you can go to my left, your right, down the stairs, out the double doors into the parking lot. Roll call. Dr. Kalman. Here. Mrs. Cushman. Here. Mr. Hamry. Here. Mr. LeBlanc. Mrs. Pickett. Here. Mr. Ryder. Here. Mr. Ungeyer. Here. Mrs. Aki. Here. Madam Chair. Here. Okay, the next item is board guests. Jean Hoy, Director of Youth Services. Well, Madam Chair, we have a very special guest this evening. Um, our current Director of Youth Services for the Town of Enfield has unfortunately finally let me know that she has decided to retire at the end of the month. So I suckered her into coming to a board meeting um, so we can give her a proper send off after all the years that she made me do things for her um, because she's the one person I can never say no to. So on behalf of the board, and I know the chairwoman would have something for you, I wanted to just say on behalf of the district, behalf of especially our administration, um, and me personally, how much of a, a of a partner you have been for us, but more importantly for our kids in, in Enfield. What people may not see uh, when they when they hear of something that happens through School Messenger is all the people behind, particularly in times of, of tragedy and sorrow. And usually that middle of the night phone call, Jean is on that list. And before I get an opportunity to crisis team in place, Jean and her staff are there. And, and she always has been a constant. Um, and it's something that she'll be greatly missed by me personally and by everyone in the district, um, but most importantly for our kids and our family. So Jean, you've been an, out, an unbelievable partner and a friend. We wish you nothing but the best of luck in retirement. I'm not really buying it yet, but um, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see what the future brings for you. But Jean, I just want to make sure that we were you got me on TV to say it, so I can't take it back. But thank you for everything. And on behalf of the board, I'm sure uh, Chair, Madam Chairwoman has something to share with you. Go on up. I'm staying. <laughs> I just want to say I can't imagine the amount of partnerships and collaboration that I've had with Chris, Hugh, and Andy, and many people up there in terms of the Youth Mental Health and Wellness Board that we established, our suicide prevention, our substance use prevention, and our mental health and our trauma informed mental health. You have done so much. We have done so much together. We haven't done it alone. We have done it together. Um, I just can't imagine what a great community we are because of you and the ability that we've had to work together and such wonderful relationships I've professionally made with all of you and I'm really going to miss you and I just hope you keep the work up because I'm going to be watching. <laughs> but Chris, I just have loved working with you over the years. You're such a caring soul who would always know what's best for our youth and really supporting their mental health and their wellness, so thank you for everything. Thank, thank you, you Jean. Thank 
The next item is Lori Gates, Wreaths Across America. I dragged her in from the street. And Pam, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Surprise, you guys have no clue why we're here, right? <laughs> um, I just want to talk for a few minutes about the Wreaths Across America convoy that's happening tomorrow ahead of Wreaths Across America's cemetery ceremony on Saturday. Because Pam and I always say we're on the same highway, we just have a couple different exits that we take, but they all converge. So we wanted to make all of that very clear for everybody. Um, the last time that this convoy came to Enfield was in 2018. 2019 was planned, but we had ice and Mother Nature didn't send an advance notice, so that got canceled. So this is gonna be the sixth time that Walmart trucking is coming back to Enfield. We are their only stop in Connecticut. They are currently overnight at the East Windsor Walmart. They could arrive this afternoon, but we're the, usually it's at a school. Because of the pandemic, it is not at a school this year. Um, they asked to come back to Enfield. And the reason that they come back is because of everybody here in this room watching at home in those schools, I might put it together, it ain't me. So um, a little bit of history. I got involved with Reese Across America on different levels since about 2010. And Pam's been involved about as long as that. She still puts up with me. And uh, in 2009, we had the first Wreaths Across America ceremony. We had a nice lady named Jean Robinson, who was the regent of the DAR at the time. And um, getting the trucks was a lark the first time, to be completely honest. Um, the Patriot Guard riders had posted online that they were escorting these wreath trucks through on their way to Arlington. And I said, what's this all about? And they said, hey, you got some place we can stop? And I said, sure. And then I said, oh, no. <laughs> because I said yes, and now I gotta figure this out. So I uh, called Maureen Sample over at Parkman, because the grades three through five demographic is perfect for this program for teaching our children the value um, of sacrifice. And so we brought them there, and they have made such an impact on the Reese Across America people that we get feedback when they're in Arlington on Saturday. Did you guys go to Enfield this year? Did you take pictures? What do they do? So we're on the map, but that is because of everybody else, because I don't see that end of it. Um, I have to give kudos to our superintendent because I called and said, hey, um, they offered to come back. I'm not comfortable in a pandemic of sticking 600 people into a school, um, especially with the age ranges that we had there. So can we do this a different way? And we came up with an idea to go past every school. And then we had to kind of nicely twist the arms of EPD to get them to do it. <laughs> and it's a huge undertaking. So the the difference this year is that the route will take them past every single public school in town. The trade-off on that is we don't have a huge convoy. In years past, there's been like a mile and a half long parade of fire and EMS. Um, it becomes a little bit cumbersome. They have to cut off 27 intersections, I think they said, to do that. So we have four trucks, tractor trailers, their safety vehicle, and a police officer on each end. And then we have area fire departments and EMS stationed at every single school. So as they approach, they'll be sounding their sirens and their lights and they get the kids amped up and that way they get to give a salute as they pass. Um, again, first time doing it this way without the huge convoy. I think it's, it's actually smart to do it this way, um, but it gives everybody the opportunity. And so far the weather looks okay for tomorrow. Um, I've been posting the route all over the place. They go wheels up at 10 a.m. at Walmart. So we're gonna end here um, with a presentation of a wreath from Walmart Trucking to the Veterans Council who will place the wreath here on the green. That's all gonna be done. They should arrive by 10.50. So it, it's quick, there's no speeches, there's no big program. Just thank you for coming and everybody, you know, get to kind of meet them and whatnot. Um, but this is one piece of a huge puzzle that goes on. And, and I know that it's difficult for people to grasp every concept of it unless you're in the inner workings. And so I don't, I don't mean it to water it down too far, but we're lucky. We're on the northeastern seaboard as they head down to Arlington. Like if we were in Ohio, this would, isn't even on the, the, the list. So 
They started last Saturday of shipping all these trucks everywhere to deliver wreaths in time for National Wreaths Across America Day, which is Saturday the 18th. We host a ceremony here. It's out everywhere across the country. It's at noon Eastern Standard Time. So while you're standing there saying the names of the people that were killed in action from Enfield, they're saying them in Arlington, they're saying them in California, everywhere. So it's all, and there is a script that allows some changes to it, but it's a, it, it's, it's a pretty well-oiled machine, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So the trucks that we have coming are passing through. There's three very large tractor trailers that are carrying wreaths headed for Arlington National Cemetery. They're usually by section, so those represents three sections. There's a smaller tractor trailer that is coming through here and then heading to the 9-11 crash site in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. And that, that's pretty special, especially given that they're passing the fire department on Weymouth Road where the twin beams are. So um, the, uh, Pam's gonna talk about the cemetery ceremony, but. When you join us at St. Patrick's um, at noon on Saturday, and that's open to everyone. You don't have to have sponsored a wreath. You don't have, just come, because it changes you. It changes you. Um, there are, because she corrected me today, 3,136 locations, okay, mm -hmm. that this is taking place in. They're placing wreaths for 2.4 million veterans this year. The theme for 2021 is live up to their legacy. So this is the first piece tomorrow. And then, as I said, I wrote this down. Pam can fill you in on Saturday's main event. See what I did there. Um, <laughs> and then we can answer questions afterwards. So I'll turn over to Pam. <laughs> Hi, good evening. Pam Townsend. And as Laurie mentioned, I'm the location coordinator for the Reese Cross America ceremony here at Enfield. I'd, um, I'd like to, before I start talking about the ceremony, I'd like to express my uh, appreciation and honor to be able to assist with the, the, um, the, whole, the whole thing, actually, <laughs> but the convoy and coordinating Enfield ceremony tomorrow. Um, and like Lori said, stuff like this doesn't just happen. It takes a whole lot of people to make it work. Enfield is very fortunate to have people like the Superintendent Drezek, Chief Fox, Sergeant Meyer, Mayor Crisati, and every everyone else that has been involved to make all of it come together for a couple hours tomorrow. It really is awesome. And personally, I've been doing this for really hot and heavy for about a month now. And every time I have to sit down or I pick up a phone or get a text, it's, it's very emotional for me. So um, coming up tomorrow is <laughs> really key. And when Lori mentions the 9-11, tractor trailer coming in. I was in DC on 9-11. So that vehicle is a little more special to me than the rest of them, even though I'm a veteran. So anyway, thank you very much for everything. As Lori mentioned, every year Reese Across America has headquarters sets a theme. And this year's theme is live up to their legacy. <clears throat> Millions of Americans come together on a set date by Congress with a global starting time of 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We come together to remember the fallen, honor those that serve and their families, and teach the next generation about the value of freedom. Enfield ceremony is on Saturday, this Saturday, December 18th. It'll take place at St. Patrick's Cemetery located at 1558 King Street. There is another cemetery called King Street Cemetery. That's not the one, we're, we're at St. Pat's. And it begins promptly at 12 p.m. And definitely the public is invited to attend. Volunteers are asked to come and place wreaths after the ceremony. I'm also excited to announce that there is an eighth ceremonial wreath that will be added to this year's ceremony. That eighth wreath represents our newest branch of service, the United States Space Force, which was established December 20th, 2019. Each wreath placed during the ceremony represents a branch of our military service, our POWs, and our MIAs. The inspiration for this year's theme came from a statement made by the United States Army Chief of Staff General James McConville in an interview with Chris Wallace on Fox News Sunday in early uh, November 2020. General McConville was, was there to speak on beha behalf of the United States Army and the upcoming opening of the National Museum of the United States Army which was being honored as the power player of the week. In discussion, he said, we stand on the sh shoulders of heroes that have gone before us 
and really what we strive to do is live up to their legacy. His message was heard by Executive Director Karen Worcester and many others and resonated deeply. Listening to this man who is a hero in his own right to speak about what and who motivates him is inspiring, said Worcester. It is the men and women who serve everyday people, giving of themselves for country and communities. I urge everyone to look to the people and the families that have made these sacrifices to keep this country free and live up to their legacy. And with that, here is some information about Enfield's Wreath Across, Wreath Across America ceremony. If you've been watching the weather report, it's been a challenge. We've gone from like 36% chance of rain up to 97, we're down to 56. So with that, rain or snow, we will have a ceremony and place wreaths to remember and honor our veterans. The weather didn't stop them from continuing to fight, fight for our freedoms. We won't let the weather stop us from remembering their sacrifices. So I ask you if you plan to, to attend and or participate, dress properly. We are in New England, never know what's gonna happen. Seating is not available. Uh, typically in the past, we were bringing in hauling in chairs and COVID changed all of that. And we found that it's actually a much better way to go and do business. So um, if you do need to have a seat, please bring your own. Anyone who's been in uh, St. Patrick's Cemetery understands that there's um, parking is, is a pretty good challenge. So we've kind of devised a parking route and there's gonna be signs and I ask everybody to please follow the signs because, um, well, there are two things I can't control. That's the weather and funerals. And guess what we got going on both that day? <laughs> we have two funerals and we have crazy weather maybe, so. We will work around that, and parking is going to be maybe a little more of a challenge, but we will have signs, and we're going to work through it. I just got to figure out where everybody um, is going <laughs> on the Perfect. funerals. So I'd like to thank the PTOs for doing a fundraiser through Reese Across America. For every $15 wreath they sp that was sponsored through their particular group, they received $5 back. And if they're interested in participating again, um, they just need to go in and reactivate their, their account. And today, which is always great news to hear from REITs across America, they announced their wreath matching pro promotion, which is when you sponsor one wreath, you get a second wreath. Um, you still get the $5 on that one that you sponsored, but the second wreath increases the numbers for the cemetery. So um, each one of the groups should have received an email today telling them about that and all they have to do is let them know. So, um, or they can give me a call, at, uh, call, give me, uh, send me an email at enfieldwaa at yahoo.com. So anyway, it is definitely an honor and a privilege to be part of Reese Across America, especially in Enfield. This town is amazing. Any person that I have reached out to when I started this in 2018 as a location coordinator. I had a clue as to what I was doing. And when I picked up the phone, reached out to someone, they were like, oh yeah, we can do that. That's not a problem. So this, this town is truly awesome and it's very, very supportive of their veterans. So I hope to see all of you on December 18th at 12 noon. And thank you so much for giving us the time to, to speak. Have a great night. I'm just gonna add one thing to what she said. Um, you knew I was going to do that, right? <laughs> I, I've always said that uh, Enfield celebrates its veterans, not just remembers them. And that's the part that we see happen now in the next four days is because w I love honoring the veterans and remembering them, and it brings the emotion into it. When you get a, a young mind to say, oh, that's what this is, you're sending a message forward. You know, there, there's a quote, I think it's by John F. Kennedy, that says, children are the messengers we send to a place we won't see. And we have to think about what messages we want to send with them. This is a huge one. And, and to watch, I mean, we did a program at Parkman some years ago, and a mom texted me and said, my kid is practicing singing the words to the national anthem in the shower. <laughs> you know? So, like, when you see that, you've made that connection and you know that connection is not going to be broken because they're going to hold on to that. And, and that's what this does. We keep the people that have 
physically left us, remembered and alive by saying their names and honoring them, and we connect the generation that's coming up with that by passing that torch to them. And I think that these pieces are very integral. We're very, very lucky that they come through here. We're lucky we have a location coordinator as passionate as we do for Saturday. We're lucky we have support from the superintendent and the police department, and everybody wants to see this happen. So thank you to everybody who's gotten the word out, offered to help. Just this is a magical four days. So it's a great feeling to go into the holiday season and know that for one, two days, we're all together. You know, there, there is no politics. There's no arguing over things. This is all just about love and respect. And I think we could all use more than that. So thank you to everybody that's helped push that forward. Thanks. Now I'm done. You're done. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, no, you can't leave yet. We may have questions, questions <laughs> comments. Uh, does anybody want to? Mr. Hamry? Uh, first off, Lori, uh, thank you. And as much as you uh, will say you don't deserve as much of it, I'm going to give you a little bit more uh, appreciation for what you've done. Uh, you and I run through similar circles every once in a great while in our support of the military communities. And um, it's just amazing to see how this has developed over the years to become what it is. Um, I've had the privilege of attending the wreath laying ceremonies across uh, the Aguam Cemetery up in Massachusetts, right across the border. Um, I've been uh, to the cemetery down in Middletown at the uh, State Cemetery for the veterans down there. Um, I've not yet been to Arlington for the ceremonies down there, but I've been to Arlington, and that's one heck of an undertaking, as anyone uh, that uh, visits the uh, website for Arlington will know. Um, I do want to just thank you again, and uh, you're truly both living up to that uh, that motto, the, the theme this year of living live up to their legacy. It's it's what I do. It's what I know you do, Lori. Uh, thank you very much for that. And um, if I might just ask for that email address one more time to me, because I couldn't write it down fast enough. Enfield W A A at Yahoo dot com. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Miss Cushman, thank you for being here. One of the things that really drew my attention um, when I was reading about wreaths across America was um, where it says wreaths across America works to create opportunities to connect the greatest generation with the generation of hope. I like to think of our youth as the generation of hope, um, passing on inspirational stories from World War II veterans to the leaders of the future. And that's such a powerful thing, you know, to really undertake. But I was curious if part of that sharing of stories, do our veterans as part of that ceremony in non-COVID times, would they go into those ceremonies and have opportunities to share their stories or are there other opportunities that they have throughout the year or maybe more around Veterans Day? Um, we had one year at Parkman, we hosted, Liz, you were there for that one, right? Yeah, we, uh, hosted some veterans in the library at Parkman after the program so that classes could go down and meet the veterans and ask questions. Okay. It was very well received. It's, it, it is a lot of undertaking to try to get a school to, because now you're talking all day, but mm -hmm. it's something I'd like to revisit because it gives the kids that one-on-one -on -one where it, it's one thing when you go to a history book and you read about a veteran, you know, you have a, that in your mind and they look a certain way or whatnot. You meet them face to face, and they say your name. It it kind of yeah. closes that gap. So that is something that I would look to do going forward if we are able to do that. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Sure. Just uh, very much admire what you're doing and the and, and, and all of your effort. Thank you very much. Um, where does it passes through Enfield? Mm -hmm. But where does it? Where does it originate? Where, did, where does this Conway start? They come from Harrington, Maine, from the Worcester Wreath Company. Worcester Wreath um, Company. Moral Worcester started this from an idea. There was a year, 2005? 30 years ago. Uh, okay, I'm wrong on the date. Um, <laughs> so 30 years ago, um, uh, he runs a wreath company. And they had extra wreaths, about 5,000, I think they said, so a truckload. And he didn't know what to do with them. And he remembered back to a field trip he had taken to Arlington when he was 12 and seeing all the graves. And he thought, oh, I could donate these and then we'll make sure that some of the veterans have them. They took pictures, started getting more and more attention with social media. And then there's an iconic photo of snow covered 
uh, ground with wreaths on all these graves. And then it picked up because other people said, well, I'd like to do that. Can I order wreaths and send them with you in your truck when you go? And it just turned into this giant undertaking mm -hmm. that they manufacture the wreaths and they do the orders and then they have the fundraising and whatnot. And just from one hmm. man's, hey, yeah. you know, I, I want to do something nice for somebody. And, and some something to point out is the all those trucks and those truck drivers, they're volunteers. Those businesses give up their their vehicles, their trucks and their, their tractor trailers to move those wreaths from Maine down to Arlington and to wherever, because they also go out to California as well. So um, they some of those wreaths have been on the road in refrigerated containers. So th you know, obviously they require a little bit different type of transportation. But yeah, volunteers all the way around. So it's an amazing feat, it really. When you watch it and you see on social media some of the comments made by the truckers as they're traveling, it's just. It's overwhelming sometimes. <laughs> we, we're still in touch with a couple of the drivers that have come through Enfield yep. in prior years. And they've been commenting, saying, oh, I remember coming to Enfield. You guys were great. They really, I mean, when the head of the Worcester Wreath Company makes a comment to somebody else that, oh, we saw the pictures in Enfield, I think we've done something right. You know, when it impacts them, here they are at Arlington putting how many thousands of wreaths yep. out. And they remember our town. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. And, and I, I've had people say, it's just a Walmart truck. No, it's not. And there's no way for me to explain that until you see it. There's something, I don't know if it's an aura, if it's an emotion, it there is something that comes with that, that if once you experience it, you totally understand and you get it. You know, it, it's, and as Pam said, now we'll, now we'll go personal. She's a retired sergeant major. So I do have to say, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> um, and the Shanksville uh, truck means a lot to her because of being in the Pentagon area during 9-11. Um, there's <clears throat> the trees up in Harrington, Maine. It's a, it's a huge, huge property. They started putting um, veterans dog tags in the trees. And so you can ask for a dog tag to be hung. And every three years, those trees are tipped and they make the wreaths and then they replace the dog tag back further in the tree for, to allow for three more years of growth. And um, I, I didn't do it, a friend did it, but my late husband's dog tags hang on a tree in Harrington, Maine. And so for me to say, you know, daddy's tree to my kids, you know, make wreaths for other veterans that go, we don't know where they go, but we know they go to a veteran's grave. It's really heartwarming. And so it was already personal to me to do this program because of what I feel for veterans. That just made it a little more personal for me, you know? And, and so it is something that grabs you by the throat when you, when you see these things. So if you haven't had the opportunity to see it, it'll change you. Definitely. And Mr. Ryder? I just wanted to say thank you to both of you. Um, and you always have our continued assistance behind the scenes with this project for as long as you're involved and, and then thereafter. Um, I just, I've, I've gone to all of the convoys that have happened thus far, so I look forward to tomorrow. Um, but I just wanted to thank you both and I'll remind the PTOs to refresh for next year and, and uh, this is something that everybody enjoys doing and enjoys promoting. Um, and it's easy to talk about the good things. Um, so I'm glad <laughs> that this is another good thing that we keep doing every year. So thank you both. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Cree. Hello. Hi. Is a wreath put on every grave site at Arlington? I'm just curious. I think that they, did they get that last year? They, they reached 100% last year. Um, when they don't have 100%, they do it in sections. Uh, and that's what I do at St. Pat's right now. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, thank you for all you do. That's great. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. How many? Do you, I know you guys counted and flagged. Do you remember how many we have at St. Pat's? Graves. So, we, are, we have approximately 1,700 veterans in St. Pat's, uh, approximately 5,000 throughout Enfield. And thanks to everyone here uh, that sponsored wreaths. And the small businesses are absolutely amazing in this community. Um, we have uh, just under 2,000 wreaths. So, um, yeah, we're, we're psyched. We're psyched for tomorrow. Yeah, uh, for, yeah, for Saturday. 
and um, we've got some Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, the Little League, and the um, the Home Depot in the Connect. I always mess their name up. They're the new semi football team in Enfield. They they just they just had Valley. a game Saturday. Uh, Connecticut Valley. I think they're the Northmen. Yeah. Northmen. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I. It's it's a long name. And I, yeah. <laughs> But um, yes, they jumped in on it. There's several veterans in their uh, group, and they were like thrilled to be a part of it. So it's I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a great day, even if it rains. <laughs> That's a little water. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if any of you have, I'm sorry. I, I just want to say the first responders are going to be at the schools. Mm -hmm. Like I said, to salute them. So if anybody in Facebook land is watching this. Don't call 911 because there's a fire truck at your kid's school. He was supposed to be there. <laughs> yeah. Just as a reminder. <laughs> yeah. um, I'd just like to say I was able to t attend the in-person ceremonies. And you're right. It definitely changes you. Um, it, you can't pinpoint a part of that program that is any better than any other piece. Um, watching the kids with their poems and their songs is amazing. It, mm -hmm. It's amazing. Um, and then when you honor the Gold Star families, it's so poignant. And when Taps plays, it's just really an emotional day. And I remember the week of 2019, and you, you were really like, oh, no, you know, I really want to have this. And and you actually, I think, said to me, is this a precursor of something else going on in the world? And it really, I guess it was, right? <laughs> um, but it is an amazing um, what you guys have organized. And I have seen the truck drivers, and they are just so happy to be here. And um, it's just such a wonderful way to honor the veterans and teach our children. And it's a way for our town to come together. And we definitely need more of that this year. So um, personally, I can't thank you guys enough. It's it's wonderful. Maybe next year we'll be, you know, back. If this works better, sometimes we're finding things work better. So, um, and this is a way to kind of encompass all the schools. So um, I think, you know, we'll have to see what next year's brings. But I thank you both very much. And Ms. Townsend, I thank you for your service. Thank, so, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I always, I always. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. I can't hear you. I'm like, what? Thank you, Madam Chair. So now you've met the two people I can't say no to, Jean and Lori. Um, and I had to remind her it's coming here because one year she surprised me and let me drive in the truck. Um, but that, that was my fault for the traffic, so. Um, I'm actually going to go a little bit out of order, if that's okay. Uh, I do have to, a few announcements to make, and then I wanted to clarify some of the questions I've received from family members uh, throughout the district with regards to, to some safety protocols. Um, but I want to thank our Chief Technology Officer, Guy Barassa, and our Business Manager, Lorena Cisneros. They actually received funding to purchase a diff additional technology equipment from uh, our E-Rate program out of the Emergency Connectivity Fund. And we're able to use those funds to purchase additional iPads. So I want to thank Mr. Brass and Mrs. Cisneros for looking for different ways to receive uh, additional iPads for our kids in the district. I mentioned that for the record because in order to receive the funds, we had to show them minutes that I told you that we're, we've received them and we're getting them. But I also want to take the opportunity to thank those two for coming, continuing to come up with creative ways to, to fund more opportunities for our kids. Um, I'll jump into the break as a reminder that all Enfield Public School students will be dismissed early with lunch on Thursday, December 24th. All schools will be closed on Friday, December 20th. I'm sorry, Thursday, December 23rd. Um, all schools will be closed on Friday the 24th through Friday, December 31st uh, for holiday break. Students and staff will return to school on Monday, January 3rd. And wish everyone happy holidays, happy new year, merry Christmas, whatever you celebrate. Uh, and lastly, I want to give an update. I've gotten a lot of questions in recent days 
um, particularly with news that everyone's seeing um, with regards to the spike in COVID cases, not just throughout the state, but throughout the country. Um, and I've also gotten some questions with regards to a comment that I made and, and I wanted to clarify um, with regards to the district's position on the screen and stay option. Um, yes, three weeks ago I did announce that we were participating in the st screen and stay program. Um, and that was our intention three weeks ago to participate in Screen and Stay program. Um, one of the things that I mentioned at the time was that it's a little bit more intricate than maybe we had all seen on, in, throughout media presentations, and I'm not knocking anyone at the state for how it was rolled out, but um, you know, typically what we've learned over the last two years when the state makes an announcement, sometimes they leave out some of the details, which is fine, um, but one of the things that we actually experienced as I was in the process of telling you guys we wanted to be a part of it, I just want to state, I want to do whatever I can to get our kids back in school quicker. I don't disagree with that premise whatsoever. The problem that we, one of the problems that we ran into um, was the criteria to be eligible for screen and stay. We found about 98% of our kids that were deemed close contacts didn't qualify for. It. So for instance, people think if I'm a close contact or if my son or daughter is a close contact, um, you know, as long as they're not showing symptoms, I can come back to school. Not entirely true. Um, you can only be a close contact if your exposure is in a school building only. So things like buses, doesn't count, not eligible. Uh, after school activities, family gatherings, play dates, all that stuff does not count. Um, and that's just one step in the criteria process for screen and stay. So as we were, we still are required to go through the contact tracing protocols and ask where kids have been, um, let them know, let the families know what the process is. What our contact tracers were finding was as we were going through and going through this checklist um, for, you know, for the screen estate protocol, whereas like I said, about 98% of our kids weren't eligible for it for one reason or another. A big reason was you have to be properly masked when you are exposed at all times. Now, I am as guilty as anyone else that if this thing falls off my nose, I didn't do it intentionally. Imagine if you're seven, the thing goes down your nose and I, I or teacher friends who are watching at home can attest how many times they have to tell their kids to put their mask back on properly. Um, if your mask is not, not on properly and that's part of your exposure period, it doesn't count. It has to be during that time when you were possibly exposed, your mask has to be on properly, you have to be a certain distance away. So what we found out was we were trying to do essentially a hybrid of that. If it was possible to get our kids back in and they met all the criteria, we were still advising families that we would do that for them. But more and more we were finding we had to tell parents, unfortunately, it doesn't apply to you because of these other requirements that aren't necessarily publicly known. So, and all of our PT, uh, all of our school newsletters as well as the district's newsletter, or the district's website, I apologize, um, the, the, there's a very concise definition of a close contact and sort of an org chart on what happens in the event your student or a staff member is exposed. Um, that's on our website. There's also a Spanish language version on our website. Um, so if anyone's just asking, looking for a quick go-to document of how did you reach this decision, um, it, the, the resource is there for you. The other thing um, with regards to screen and stay that, and I understand, and I, I've answered some parents' questions saying, look, I know this is confusing for you, it's confusing for us, and it's confusing for our, our nurses. Um, one of the things that, that wasn't very well publicized, but it was a big component of it, and it was always expressed verbally, was this is a decision that the district can make in consultation with your local public health advisors. You also have to remember, when this was rolled out from at the state level, Times were a lot different when it came to community spread. Um, I know you guys all probably get phone alerts about where our numbers are every day, and I don't wanna relive the last two years when I used to have to put a chart up here and tell where everybody was, uh, where we were in Enfield, where we were in the, in, the, in the district, the health district, and where we were in the state. Um, but just to put in perspective, you know, at the time last year when I put those numbers in that chart up, uh, the magic number was number of cases per 100,000 lives. Um, and the algorithm that the state developed to develop the color system, when you go from yellow to orange to red, um, red was at 15 cases per 100,000. So anything above 15 cases per 100,000 um, would put your community in the red zone, not in a good way like in football. Um, currently, and I've confirmed this with our health director this afternoon, um, as of the most up-to-date data today, Enfield currently sits at 60.4, 60. 
that's one of the highest percentage rates I can remember throughout the last couple of years. I know it had creeped up there at some point at the peak pre-vaccination last year. Um, but that's where we are now. So in consultation with our local health director, um, part of the criteria for screen and stay is to consult with your director of public health and decide whether it's a good idea for your community to participate. I've also been notified since the last time I've been up here um, that a lot of districts that were participating in them have suspended that participation because of the increase in community spread and the fact that it isn't applying as, much as it originally intended to do. So we're looking at every potential contact on a case-by-case -case basis. We want to do everything we can, most importantly, to keep people safe, to keep people not sick. Um, but if we can get kids back in school quicker, because we all can agree that in-person learning is much more beneficial than being at home or learning on a device, um, we'll do everything that we possibly can. Unfortunately, there are protocols and rules that are constantly and have been constantly moving for the last two years that we're trying to adhere to. So I just wanted to clarify and, and, and direct people to our website if you wanted just a quick chart version of, of how these decisions are made, but also to put in perspective, you know, unfortunately, our you know our, our rolling average of 14 days has is higher than it's been in the last year and a half. And I'm making this stuff up. This is what they tell me. It comes from the state. It comes from the health department. Um, so right now, we, we've been advised against that. A lot of districts that I've spoken with have paused their programs, and we're going to reassess it after the first of the year with the hope that things calm down a little bit. Um, and I know there's a lot of talk as well about um, you know protocols for winter sports activities that are currently under review. Um, I unfortunately, you know, I've always tried to just tell you guys facts and <laughs> tell you what it is and not sugarcoat things. I, it, the whole thing hasn't figured out yet. We had, everybody had a plan, you know, the January, right around Christmas break, if you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask. That's how it still stands today. I can't tell you if that's going to change tomorrow because the numbers change on a daily basis. So what I can tell you is we're going to do everything we can to keep being flexible, keep adjusting. But the one thing that hasn't changed was what's in the best interest of our kids, and that's getting them in school and keeping them in school as long as we can. The last thing in the world I want to do is have to shut a school down because, you know, we have an increased spread in the building. So I also want to let parents who are watching at home, um, you will in the next few days, because of the information I shared tonight, um, get a communication from your building principal. We haven't locked everything in yet, but, you know, we were fortunate at the beginning of the year when the numbers were better that we could ease some of the restrictions in places where we were able to do so. But because of this, and we have a large amount of kids in quarantine right now that we're trying to avoid, uh, we're gonna have to tighten our belts a little bit more with things like distancing and when kids are eating and where they're eating and things like that. Um, I know the board had some questions, it was the previous board about our, our voluntary testing program. Um, and that's strictly with parental permission um, for any parent. Um, that and is primarily for kids at the time, it was designed for those who weren't eligible for the vaccine, um, that if they wanted their children tested on a weekly basis, the state would, would provide that. And that's all done. We don't do the testing ourselves. There is, as some of you may know, um, especially you, Dr. Callan, there's a testing shortage again. So getting access to tests isn't as easy as it used to be. Um, but our students, especially those who were not eligible for the vaccine, um, were able to enroll in a voluntary testing program. Um, to date, we've actually caught 10 positive asymptomatic students from that voluntary testing program, which probably in turn um, saved a number of kids from A, contracting the virus, but also having to quarantine as a result of that because there was early detection. So we're doing what, what we everything that we can um, with the hopes that this will be over and I never have to talk about it again. But um, we're not quite there yet. We're going to keep plowing forward to get through this, but I wanted to make sure that I provided the most up-to-date information I had and with the expectation that, like everything else the last two years, it could change tomorrow. That will conclude the superintendent's report. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is audiences. Okay, I'm just going to read something before we start on the audiences. Um, you must be an Enfield resident to participate in the audience portion of the meeting. We ask that you state your name and address. 
Board members cannot respond back to you during this portion of the meeting. The board members can respond during their board member comments if they choose to do so. We also cannot respond to student or personnel matters. We strongly ask that you refrain from personalities. We also strongly ask that you refrain from yelling out during audiences or board members during their comments. We will allow three minutes for each audience member wishing to speak. Um, we had our policy meeting on Tuesday and it was discussed about changing the audience portion um, to make it a little bit more flexible. So that is being worked on and it'll be on the agenda in January uh, to discuss that. So. Matt Schmidt. <clears throat> Matt Schmidt, 1304 Bigelow Commons. Good evening, board members. I'm here tonight as an Enfield resident, a bona fide stakeholder in the public education of the children of Enfield a stakeholder strongly opposed to the school mask mandates. I've been coming before you since late summer, trying to open a dialogue about the state mandated school board imposed mask rules. Not only have I presented arguments against the mandate, but this past September, I publicly asked for data relevant to Enfield schools COVID policies. The type of data which other school districts like Windsor Locks and South Windsor readily share on their school website. Since no information had been forthcoming and I had never even received a response as to why this board would refuse to make this data public, I had to resort to Freedom of Information Act requests to try to get some answers. I originally submitted seven different records requests, but I want to discuss one in particular tonight. I requested Enfield Public Schools mass break policy. I was told the request was effectively denied because there is no mass break policy. That's right. This board implemented a universal mask mandate, the most restrictive and all-encompassing public health countermeasure on the student body ever, yet it neglected to institute a policy that would offer these children a reprieve. But maybe this is a good thing. A week before the most recent election in regard to masks, the J.I. quoted board member Pickett as saying she tries to offer creative solutions like more mask breaks. So maybe mask breaks is a good place for all of us to start finding solutions. Though it is admittedly a very small step, I am open to that, and I think many parents and students would be as well. So I hope the other members of this board are willing to join Ms. Pickett in finding creative solutions to concerns like masking. Because we already have had 92 students withdraw from Enfield schools this year, some I know for certain due to the board's hesitancy to act on issues that concern them. With budget season nearly upon us, a decline in student enrollment, enrollment will surely negatively affect our school district from a state and federal funding standpoint and will put teachers' jobs at risk. We all say we support teachers, but having known many teachers, I can say that declining enrollment is one of a teacher's greatest fears because it means layoffs. And I don't think anyone here supports that. So we need to get rid of this political paralysis that seems to have washed over our institutions these last two years. We all need to work to solve our issues, and I applaud Ms. Pickett for at least speaking about it. But solutions require active engagement, with stakeholders, including answering their questions. This board is very good at highlighting the positive happenings of Enfield schools, and it should continue to do so, but not at the exclusion of the pressing concerns that confront us. Sidestepping, ignoring, or dismissing is counterproductive. So let's be transparent, let's work to find solutions, and let's start to unmask, even in some small way, Enfield's children. Thank you. Rob Anderson. Hello. My name is Rob Anderson, 34 Bass Drive. I wasn't going to speak tonight, but in the last meeting, an older woman spoke. I'd like to address some of her comments. She commented about people not having kids in school should not be here. I'm a taxpayer. I do my part in funding the school system. It doesn't matter if I have kids. I have the right to speak and I will not be bullied by anybody. Then she asked us to stop targeting the kids. I agree with this. 
Stop tar targeting the kids. Let them be kids. Stop feeding them fear. Her next comment, don't tell us what to do and what education we should teach them. Who is us and we in that statement? This type of hate just drives a divide between people and does no good. Then she mentions Nazis. I want to be clear, this is not Germany and we are not Nazis, she says. Nobody ever said you were Nazis. It's sad that you take it that way. And on her 24 years in the military, she mentioned that she never questioned it when, she, when her country asked her to take shots. I'm sorry, but I think that's an ignorant position to take. When you're a soldier, you do as you're told, and I can understand that completely. But this is not the military, and we will question it. Why is it so hard for us to work together, she asks. Mr. Answer Anderson, I have to ask you to stop because it's a, against a personality. No, she's not, she's not mentioning a name. I didn't mention any name, and I'm not doing anything different than what she did that night. You're, excuse me. I disagree. Yeah. Did I, did I mention a name? No, but we know who you're speaking of. Uh, I think we disagree. I'm all good. Let him talk because we know it's about me. And I, I have no, uh, no bit. I don't run and hide. I mean, Rob got something to say. He should have just said it to my face. That's fine. Mr. Anderson, you can continue, and I'm not going to do anything about the time. You can finish. Thank you. Why is it so hard for us to work together, she says because you do not want to work together. You want us to do what you want, period. You don't want to know anything about the reasons that someone has made the choices they have. She says people want to silence what we want to teach our children. When what you want to teach children is going to create activists that are seven years old, that's a problem. Activism in politics should be kept out of the school system. The school systems have lost the checks and balances that are required to offer a neutral education that allows students to form their own opinions and instead opinions are forced on them. And in closing, she says, let's not focus on the hate or the fake news. I've not heard anybody that opposes what's going on in the schools to be hateful or be promoting fake news. The only ones that I've heard be hateful and refusing to listen to anything that doesn't support their view of what's correct are sitting here with masks hiding their faces. Thank you. Amanda Marquez. Amanda Marquez, 8 Hoover Lane. How many students have tested positive this school year? How many staff? How many of each have had to quarantine based on the state's formula? How many students have been disciplined based on mask usage? How many mask breaks per day are children entitled to? Are breaks based on hours at school? Are children who lo have longer bus rides to and from school allowed more mask breaks? Are mask breaks based on state guidance or is there some other rubric used? Do you support the rights of parents to decide what medical interventions such as masks or vaccines their children should receive? Or do you support government mandates? Is federal and state funding contingent on mask mandate compliance? Has the Board of Education received ARP funds? Will those funds be used to improve air quality in our schools? Are we going to put air conditioning and filtration systems in the schools? Can you provide an itemized list of the monies that have been given from the state for COVID relief in detail and any projected expenses? 
Is it the board's job to educate the children in matters of morality, or is that the realm of the parents? Is CRT or any derivative of it appropriate or beneficial to our curriculum? Do you believe parents should play a role in deciding what is taught to their children? Will there be supports in place for students experiencing self-shame due to being taught that they are inherently racist due to their skin color? Are the counselors prepared for the outpouring of new questions and concerns that come with incorporating such personal subjects such as sexuality into the classroom? What will the financial impact on our town be if a lawsuit from FAIR is brought forth for discrimination? Five months, residents have been sitting here before this board repeatedly presenting these very questions with no answers, no solutions, and barely a response. Your own board policy 1000 labeled concepts, goals, and roles in community relations states that the Board of Education recognizes that the community determines the quality of local education. This policy also states how it establishes a goal of soliciting community opinions about the school systems. Is that only when the presented opinions of the school system align with the board? Another board policy 1300.1 titled Community Relations states, the Board of Education endorses the concept that community engagement is essential for the district and the community to maintain mutual understanding, respect and trust, and to work together to improve the quality of edu education for district students. The board intends through this two-way communication to identify the community's concerns, needs, and suggestions, and to be responsive to the community through the board's actions. So please clarify how you are sincerely held to following your policies and yet meeting after meeting when the community sits before you, you decide who is deserving of your responses and actions and who isn't. Current board members stated at their inauguration meeting, I hope that we will be able to work out resolutions for all the issues that concern our community. Another, I try to leave politics at the door and always be true to what is best for everyone in town, even those residents who may not be involved in this school system because they have a voice too. Another, families and students, your voice, your perspective, your feedback and engagement is what matters. Keep it coming. Yet your very first meeting after being sworn in, our concerns were ignored. It was as if we weren't even here speaking at all. Not only is this completely hypocritical, it is extremely disheartening, and you don't even hold true to your own words. The lack of response to any questions for the better part of the school year has led me to personally remove my children from Enfield Public School System, but it will not stop me from coming before you, advocating for critical thought, and reminding you that for masks, there's a simple solution, and one that doesn't mean tossing out our individual civil liberties, and it goes like this. Those who choose to wear a mask can do so, and those who don't are not mandated against their free will. Kim Anderson. Good evening. Sorry. Kim Anderson, 34 Bass Drive. On Thursday, December 9th, 2021, the Ellington Board of Education approved a letter to the Commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Health and a statement which is on the website that says, the Ellington Board is concerned with stigmatizing the CIAC DPH policy direction. I would like to read a small part of that letter and then make a short comment. The letter in its entirety is linked, and I will submit that with my comments to the board via email. The entirety of the letter can be read online at ellingtonpublicschools.org, and the press conference given by the Ellington Board is available on YouTube. The letter reads in part, the board is concerned that DPH, in concert with the Connecticut State Department of Education, will consider a similar policy direction and or support legislation that will continue to visibly distinguish students based upon their medical status during the school day. The Ellington Board of Education writes to express its concerns regarding the direction of a potential guideline, creating distinctions between students whose families make the different, legally protected medical decisions specifically on the choice to vaccinate or not against COVID-19. We do have concerns about policy that visibly distinguishes between students whose families may choose different medical paths. These are detailed below. I'd like to read just two. Policy options whereby the only I'm sorry, policy options whereby only the unvaccinated would be required to mask presents such students as potential targets for discrimination and harassment within the school setting. We have heard reports from within our community about the exclusion of students and families who are unvaccinated from social settings. We are concerned such a visible distinction could deepen the divides within the community and spill over into our schools. Deci two, decisions to vaccinate cut along demographic lines by socioeconomic status, race, and religious conviction. 
the board does not wish to see an unintentional distinction between students based on protected demographics. Now, this is my, my comment. The following is from the Enfield Public Schools Equity and Diversity Mission Goals and Objectives, number 0523, which states, ensure, each, ensure that each school creates a welcoming culture and inclusive environment that reflects and supports the diversity of the district's student population, their families, and their communities. Marking children by identifying them by medical status would not be creating a welcoming culture. It would not be inclusive, nor would it be supportive in any way, shape, or form. Connecticut keeps doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result, which is the, re the definition of insanity. Approaching day 639 of 15 days to slow the spread, masks are now being considered as leverage, not just against adults, but now it's creeping into the school system. And the bright side to this is Enfield has a wonderful opportunity to stand alongside Ellington, and I hope you do. I hope you're proactive instead of reactive, and I hope you do the right thing and stand by your mission as it is written. Thank you. Ryan Schultz. Good evening, Ryan Schutz, 106 Church Street. The superintendent and board of ed in Ellington took a stand against the current CIAH and DPH policy, which gives me hope you will follow in, the, in their path. I suggest to contact their superintendent or anyone on their board, find out their reasons and concerns for doing so. These mandates are clearly not about health. If it was, let's start with the fundamentals, proper sleep, diet, exercise, time spent outdoors in the sun, none of which were talked about or of any concern. Instead, masks that don't work and vaccines that don't either. Last time I spoke, I touched on the Lancet peer review done on effectiveness of the vaccines and how they played the numbers. With which states you're 99% just as likely to contract COVID with a vaccine. Now look at what we're seeing with this new variant. Mind you, that came from four vaccinated people. Look how our great Governor Lamont abuses his power all while him and his wife continue to profit every day in the name of COVID. Things once God given have now become man made, and we are the customers. Air to breathe, water to drink, food to eat, people to love, hobbies and passions to pursue. There's a handful of men that came and sabotaged, suppressed, locked it up, and created policies and laws to govern your mind. Tainted, polluted air, plastic pandemic, fake food, mass slaughterhouses, GMO, chemical additives, pesticides, and companies that work with big pharma, synthetic medicines, petroleum-based, bottled and pilled and labeled and prescribed. We become a customer to the business. Once realized the things that are virtually free in nature, they become opportunity for men to exploit, manipulate, create issues, and feed into the agenda of control, toxicity, and victim mentality. We've made huge gains in technology. We must wake up to this control, tyranny, and agendas that don't have our best interest or the Earth's best interest at heart. This starts with you and me. Please do the right thing for my child and the future generations to come. Please unmask our kids. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the board? Okay, audience is closed. Ooh, sorry about that. We're gonna start with board member comments. I'm gonna start with Dr. Kelman. Mr. Hamry. <laughs> So I want to thank again uh, the Wreaths Across America for coming in tonight. Um, very personal uh, uh, program for me. It's uh, it, it strikes a chord in uh, to those that don't know. I've got a brother that's laid to rest down in Arlington. So uh, to know that the uh, memory uh, goes on means all the all the everything. 
So uh, one thing that I want to highlight about that, the ceremony that uh, takes place when the wreaths are laid at the headstones, at the tombs of the uh, service members, uh, the process would be that the individual that's laying the wreath down doesn't just drop it and move on to the next one. They say the name of the person they're, they're laying the, the wreath down to so that the person's name literally will be said out loud and is on the mind of the person that's laying the wreath down. So again, very, very special to me that that, that is continuing. And again, I want to acknowledge and thank the uh, efforts to make that happen. I was able to attend the uh, JFK PTO meeting this evening for about uh, 10 minutes, um, but that was long enough for me to get a couple of things, including an appreciation for what uh, Mr. Ryder does to maintain the PTO uh, websites to keep all of these schools' PTOs updated and current. And um, JFK's sponsored, uh, I believe, 10 wreaths for this year's ceremonies from uh, for Wreaths Across America. Um, very happy to see that. They're also having a fundraiser for the, um, a brick fundraiser to support the PTO. And that goes through December 31st. You can visit the website through PTO, uh, EnfieldPTO.org? Dot com. com, excuse me, slash JFK. And you'll find information there for uh, purchasing a brick to support the JFK PTO. Um, bear with me just a moment. I want to make sure I got all my uh, notes down here. Um, yeah, that's it for the time being. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sakri? I just wanted to wish everyone Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and enjoy your family. And we're looking forward to seeing you and trying to resolve these issues. Yes, we are working on it in 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cushman. I was reflecting, Tina, or I should say Madam Chair, um, you know, at our newly, at our initial meeting as a newly elected board that you had reflected on your years that you have served our schools and community as a member of the Board of Education. And you com commented that along the way you found your voice. And I think there's many of us here tonight, as well as those who have been coming regularly who may not be here in recent months who never really expected, I know I can say for myself, never really expected to be in these chambers speaking publicly. Yet for many, it seems, they are finding their voice. There are many that are coming to voice their concerns for the health of all Enfield children in the face of mandates that may seem to threaten our freedoms, concerns about the educational content in some of our classrooms, and even some who come to these chambers because they see this as a safe place to voice their concerns when they have not been well received at the state or the national level. So I'm thankful for the parents and the community members who come to exercise the rights that we value as a democracy. Your voices are certainly heard. And we have been, um, you know, as we've been coming together as a new board and meeting in our committees, there are things happening behind the scenes that you're not seeing here in these, in these board meetings, but we do hear your voices and we are working together. Thank you. Mr. Unger? So <clears throat> I ditto to what Janet and Jean said and and uh, Josh, thank you for uh, um, making us aware of your brother. You didn't know that. Um, I want to thank everyone who did speak here tonight. I mean, these are very important issues, and I know uh, that they're important. They're important to me. And um, I did pay attention to what happened in Ellington, and um, I think um, I think. Um, we need to address that here, and uh, I'll work to try to address that. Um, 
beyond that, just a couple of couple of uh, things. One is um, I did reach out to uh, John Dague and uh, had a conversation with him. Great guy, and uh, he heads up the technical robotics effort within our school system, and he put me uh, in line with uh, Carolyn Marr and uh, Lauren Jefferson, who is Carolyn's uh, co-advisor. So I'm going to be reaching out to those ladies and, and uh, working to uh, uh, provide some input in, the, in those programs where I think we could, we could all benefit from. I did reach out to Julie Carroll. She's our chief pupil services officer and trying to research. She heads up uh, um, Eagle Academy. I want to learn more about Eagle Academy and our special education efforts here in Enfield. And so I'm working to arrange a meeting with, with her. Um, and then I guess I want to finish by just by saying uh, I want to wish all of our students a uh, very Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, our, not only our students, but our faculty, our, our teachers, our staff, our administrators, all the residents of Enfield. Merry Christmas um, 2022. All the best and blessed 2022. And I look forward to uh, um, getting some things done in 2022. So thank you all. Ms. Pickett. Thanks. Uh, first, I want to start my comments um, by just pausing for a moment and reflecting on this state. So thank you, Dr. Kalman, for starting the meeting that way. But um, remembering the 26 lives lost on December 14th, nine years ago, um, I believe it's pertinent now more than ever um, with the raising national and even local concerns around behavior, safety, and mental health. I also want to wish everybody a happy holidays. Um, this season holds many special cultural celebrations, holidays, and traditions, Christmas, Kwanzaa, Hanukkah, Three Kings Day, New Year's. Um, so let us also remember that there are other important celebrations that happen at other times of the year. So um, holidays are a special time. I agree this month is special for my family and I, but there are many other holidays that happen throughout the year. Um, I hope at some point we get to hear from our high school uh, students. I have heard that we are participating in the Voice for Change um, effort, um, which actually gives students the chance to submit proposals for how they would spend $20,000 in their schools to enhance academic support, mental health, connect with communities, and use technology. So I'd love to hear kind of what our kiddos come up with, and hopefully Enfield gets a chance to uh, reap the benefits of that. Um, I think kids have amazing opportunities to come up with creative solutions um, that we could all learn from. Uh, I also want to thank Enfield's um, Congregational Church, who held a blessing for us. Uh, was that last Sunday? All a blur, it seems like. Along the same night as the Torchlight Parade, which was another great event. Um, and on Saturday, I was able to attend for a short period of time uh, the Lego Robotics event, which was awesome to see our elementary school students and middle school students working together um, on uh, those competing cool Lego projects um, and PowerPoint presentations, which I was impressed by. Uh, my two schools, so Parkman, um, thank you to their PTO president who is uh, amazing and sent me an email and let me know all of the great things happening there. Um, they recently had a holiday vendor fair that allowed the families um, as well as the public to participate in a what used to be their typical holiday shop. Their next in-person PTO meeting will be uh, tomorrow night at 6.30 at the Parkman Library. Um, they're also having an in-person Moe's night on January 18th from 5 to 8 at Moe's on Hazard Ave. Enfield Street School on the 12th of January will be um, our next PTO meeting. Um, and then just a couple things. Chris, thank you for addressing uh, the COVID protocols. I empathize with you. I know the um, guidelines are shifting constantly. Um, I'm happy to see that the protocol was included in the newsletter and on the website. I'm wondering if this could be part of like procedures when somebody's a close contact that it's like almost handed to them um, with like a when's the date you can get tested. Um, it's challenging as a parent. My daughter was recently a close contact and in like the chaos of just like hearing about it and then like processing what does that mean for us? Sometimes stuff is just like lost in translation. Um, so I think that would possibly be helpful with just consistency um, with clear instructions. I'm also 
hoping that there's some creative solution we can up, come up with with testing. I know there's a shortage, um, but it is, I know we participate in the voluntary testing program. Not sure if there's a way we could expand that in any way to support students um, who might be close contacts. Um, that's a state program, so you probably don't have the answer to that, but something to explore. <laughs> Along um, with testing locations and vaccine locations, um, I just think as much information as families can have, it might be helpful. Um, the other piece that I want to just mention to everybody, that there is a webinar being hosted by the State Department of Ed and CCMC um, on the latest medical information to keep kids um, safe, healthy, and in school during the winter months. You can find out more information by um, visiting CERC's website, S-E-R-C um, dot info backslash house call 1216. So that's happening on the 16th. Um, the other thing, and you know, it's it's kind of connected to how I opened my comments. It's a concerning time. Um, I know Enfield has had our own behavioral um, and safety concerns. Um, it's happening across the state and, and nation. Um, and I'm just, you know, hopeful that with the ARP ESSER funding and with continued support from the board, um, we can really address all of the proactive work to support our students um, and our staff in creating a safe and inclusive environment at school, um, including some of the social emotional learning work um, to just help our kiddos. And then Jean left before I was able to say this to her and I like totally forgot to open my mic. Um, but Jean and I crossed paths before I ever lived in Enfield professionally. Um, and I heard about work she was doing in the community um, through my work um, in substance misuse prevention. And um, I connected with her way back then and just to, to know that she was an asset in our community. And I just wanted to thank her professionally um, and personally being a community resident. And the last piece is around Kite. Um, they recently came out with a community resource guide. It is on their website. Please check it out. Um, their next meeting is on January 5th. Um, there's also a dive into a diversity event for our young families um, and um, a parent discussion. So please check out their website and consider signing up for those. Thank you. Mr. Ryder. So update for the meeting at Eli Whitney. Um, Whitney, as well as all the other schools, are very excited, first of all, for the Wreaths Across America convoy tomorrow. Um, so if you live along the path, which is posted on Facebook, um, it, it's also an Enfield PTO um, Facebook page, but it has the path. So if you live along that route, please come out of your homes, set up a chair in your front yard, you know, watch it go by. It is amazing. And because they're literally going in and out of all of our neighborhoods to pass all of our school buildings, Though there's, there's a lot of opportunities for neighbors as well as our students and staff to en to enjoy and to celebrate um, that. And I wanted to uh, to mention that I hope that more of the community comes out besides just at these you know 10 or 11 addresses. I think that would be amazing. Um, they are halfway through their 12 days of raffles. Um, you can buy your raffle ticket. It's a $5 per entry. Your name stays in every day. Even if you buy a ticket tonight while you're watching this and you win tomorrow, your name still stays in for the balance of the, uh, of the raffles. They still have American Girls to give away, four pack of tickets for the Yard Goats, uh, Hartford Wolf Pack, gift cards to CVS, and uh, a, a local hair salon that made a donation of a $100 gift card. That's this Thursday, so get in before Thursday if you want that. Um, there's also uh, Invention Convention begins, I believe, at the 3-5 level. I know specifically it's at Whitney starting uh, this week on the 16th. Um, there's also Spirit Wear Days coming up for a lot of our elementary schools, our K-2 and 3-5 buildings. Um, I believe there's something also in the works coming for JFK. Um, but they'll be doing Spirit Wear Days where you dress like a gingerbread man or wear your favorite holiday colors. Um, but all that's available on infillpto.com slash your school slash Whitney slash JFK, et cetera. Um, on the 23rd, we obviously have our early release day. There'll also be a holiday assembly at Whitney uh, and a bingo event at nine. And that's another day that kids can wear their PJs to school. Um, so Merry, Happy New Year and, and all the good holidays to everybody. Um, we also got a notice that we have two Enfield residents that attend the Suffield Regional Agri-Science Center. Um, and just two students from Enfield will be receiving the American degree, which is the highest degree a, uh, a member can earn 
through the American FAA degree, which is the Forever Blue Ceremony. So on Tuesday, December 21st at 1130, um, I, I'm sorry, 1030 that morning, um, perhaps that's something that we could attend and have sure. leadership go and that would be great. Um, so that in our packet. And now the big news for tonight, uh, two things. A couple of us are wearing white today. Today was whiteout day at the uh, JV and varsity girls basketball at EHS. So I couldn't be there for the game. So I'm wearing my uh, Enfield whites uh, to celebrate our girls. Um, and hopefully both games were a success. I do not have a ticker. I do not have ESPN here. I don't know how they did, but I'm, I'm hoping that they're uh, off to a great start this season. Um, PJ Day, as everybody knows, is also very important to myself and our PTOs and our families and our bus drivers and our administrators and our staff. Everybody loves doing PJ Day. So on Friday, December 10th, we had our PJ Day here in Enfield. And our goal this year, because we just cracked the 7,000 mark last year, our goal this year was to raise $7,777.77, which I just thought looked like a nice number on the computer screen and, and wasn't sure if we'd even hit it or not. However, um, you'll see tomorrow when you check that our grand total for Enfield, and there may be a dollar here or a dollar there that fell in a seat cushion on a bus, and that might come to us later this week. But we have raised over $9,000 as a town, as a school district, uh, with, through our busing partners, $9,366, which was thousands of dollars above our goal, um, more than we'd ever raised before. And I'm very proud to say that Enfield, uh, Enfield slash Enfield PTO slash Smith Bus slash our staff, everybody. Um, we are the number two fundraiser for the entire CCMC PJ Day for the entire state, which also includes a few towns in Southern Massachusetts. Um, uh, so we are second only to Coventry. And uh, that's actually the town where this event started 12 years ago with PJ Day. Um, it was just a uh, a boy's wish to do because his infant sister was uh, dealing with cancer. She was spending the holidays at CCMC, and he thought if he could bring in a dollar to his principal, maybe he could wear his PJs for the day like his sister got to. And similar to the wreaths idea, it just grows and grows and grows um, through people like you that are dedicated to it and people that promote it and people that take part in it. So I want to thank everybody in Enfield um, and to Smith Bus and all of our schools. Um, Alcorn Stowe, separately ECDC, had an envelope inside the Stowe envelope, Enfield Street, Henry Barnard, Hazardville Memorial School, Parkman, Whitney, Prudence Crandall, JFK, Enfield High, Eagle Academy, and Smith Bussing. Thank you to all of our buildings and our partners. Okay, uh, my turn. Uh, I also attended the first LEGO League Robotics um, at Enfield High. Um, it was a blast because I loved watching the kids, uh, working with kids, and the JFK kids, Oh, I had to laugh. One of them, they said they were keeping Mr. Bailing in line. Like they had to make sure that he was, uh, you know, judging correctly. The, the kids were great. Um, it was a really great event to be at and the imaginations and the, um, the way the kids uh, build and is amazing to me. So I, I was so happy I could attend that. I was also gonna speak of the Enfield High girls basketball. Um, hopefully they're still playing and um, they're winning, but We'll find out soon enough. Um, PJ Day on Friday was amazing, and um, I want to thank Scott Ryder for um, advocating for that for all those years and um, getting the excitement and the enthusiasm behind it, and it really showed this year. Um, you know, we have our own um, students and families that are affected by childhood cancer in our district, so it really means a lot when a district comes together and does that. Um, I attended the Torchlight Parade, which was so well attended by the Enfield community. It was amazing to see everyone out there and the carol sing and Mr. and Mrs. Claus. If you weren't in the Christmas spirit before that, hopefully you got into the Christmas spirit that night. Um, it was just amazing to see. Um, SafeGrad is in full swing um, at Enfield High, and recently we had our SafeGrad auction that did really well. And I'd like to thank our board members um, for um, working together and, and donating a basket, and, and that proved successful. Um, but one of the things I wanna talk about with that auction is, and it goes back to what um, Ms. Townsend was saying, that auction is run strictly on donations, and they, 
the small businesses in town were more than generous, more so than the bigger corporations that used to donate. So if you can, if you need Christmas gifts or you're looking to go out and buy, please support your small businesses this holiday season. Um, they gave generously and they are the smallest of the businesses. And um, a lot of those small business owners live in town and it's just amazing for that. Um, I would like to say there is a spirit week at MTL High. Okay. Oh, um, but I think it's like socks. It's not like dressing as a gingerbread man, but I saw that on uh, the Instagram page. So I just, I thought I'd throw that out there. Uh, today is the Sandy Hook anniversary, which I think is always heavy on our hearts, um, especially in Connecticut. And I bumped into a teacher and she said today her class was going to do one kind act. And I thought that was a nice way to commemorate and re remember as a day of remembrance for um, Sandy Hook, because I think it's just a hard day for all of us. I, I woke up today and I said, oh, why am I it's just a heavy day? And it always will be. So um, I appreciate Dr. Kalnan uh, remembering that. Lastly, um, I would like to wish my board um, a very Merry Christmas and Happy Holiday. I would like to wish all the students and staff and families a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, however you celebrate. Um, please uh, be together with your family when you can and stay safe, stay healthy. And I'm wishing everybody a much better uh, 2022. I think we said that last year. We saw how that happened. So um, I think I saw something the other day that said, when 2022 gets here, just let it come in quietly. Don't say anything, just let it come in. So I think um, I just wish us all a, a happy 2020. So thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is unfinished business and there's nothing listed. And then we move on to new business and it's action, if any, regarding John F. Kennedy calendar modification. Thank you, Madam Chair. So at the last meeting, I mentioned that uh, Bill Wynn Construction is actually moving the JFK renovation project faster than anticipated. And we did receive a request from them about students not being in the building on December 23rd or January 3rd. Um, so that staff will have time to set up um, their new classrooms, get ready for when students return. And as you recall from previous building projects, um, it's often, we've had to do this at Enfield High School. We've actually had to do this um, at JFK, but last year we were able to do remote days. We weren't able to do that this year. Um, so I wanted to put on everyone's radar at the last meeting that I was gonna request that the board make some modifications to the school calendar, because that's something that's within your purview. And what I'm recommending, and I've spoke with the folks at Enfield, uh, at JFK, excuse me, um, and, and with the folks at Gilbane, um, the problem we run into of not having students in the building for two additional days, uh, the board has the authority to, currently our students go to school 181 school days. So the board has the authority to waive the 181st day. If we eliminate two days, we're gonna need to make one of those up. The problem is we would not be on the same schedule with the remainder of the district because if JFK had to make up an additional day, that means we'd have to run buses, uh, nutrition services for the entire district, for JFK only an additional day at the end of the year. And our JFK kids would get out of school a day later than all of their friends and colleagues that are in other buildings. So what I was proposing is, and it's within the board's purview, to make Wednesday, December 22nd, an early dismissal day for JFK only. That would be an 11 a.m. dismissal with no lunch for that day. Um, December 23rd is already a regularly scheduled early dismissal day. That's a 1 p.m. dismissal for the entire district. Uh, well, JFK is 1 p.m. It's an early dismissal for the entire district. Lunch will be served that day. And then I would recommend that the board has no, that the board institute a, a complete off day for Monday, January 3rd for JFK only. If the board decides to take action on that, that would leave JFK at attending 180, cal 180 school days this calendar year, or this school year. Um, you would then need to waive your policy on the 181st day for JFK only, not for the remainder of the district. All of that is contingent upon there not being any weather days this year. Um, with, and if all goes according to plan, which we're hopeful, but nothing goes according to plan in the last couple of years, um, June 16th would mark the 180 first day for everyone in the district outside of JFK. That would be one, day 180 for JFK, but that would be the last scheduled day of school for the entire district. Our JFK students would have to make up that day on their own. So just to reiterate, 
what I'm asking the board to consider is making Wednesday, December 22nd, an early dismissal day at 11 a.m. with no lunch for JFK only. You do not have to take any action on the 23rd. That's already set in your calendar. And then it would be no school, no students for Monday, dis, uh, January 3rd. Uh, and students would return to JFK on Tuesday, January 4th. Staff would report on those days because that's the opportunity for them to move into their new classrooms. Any questions? Mr. LeBlanc? Well, I apologize for being uh, late, but um, I'm glad I got here in time for this. I did have a couple questions. Um, one, um, I guess not really direct questions, but more in line with concerns that I heard in regards to this. One being, I guess for lack of better terms, um, that the kids have already, A, missed enough school, so this is kind of taken away from um, another day of in-person school with them. And secondly, um, just a concern about the communication that went out about this. I know it was in the newsletter, and I know you, superintendent, spoke of it um, at our last meeting, but, <coughs> excuse me, I guess somewhere in the correlation there, um, or in the time frame there, parents were a little upset about there not being more information going out about this. So those were just kind of my, my two concerns about it. I, I, I haven't received any of the complaints about, from parents about communication. It, it wouldn't be possible. I think the communication from Principal Berrios was that this was under consideration. I, I don't have the authority to do that. So the only one who can alter the calendar on this is, is you guys with removing a day. Um, I could change a day to a half day, but obviously that doesn't work for the needs of Gilbane to get everybody transitioned into their new wing. Um, and as I said, what, one of the things that I had, the original proposal that was sent to me um, was to have no school on the 23rd, uh, on the 22nd, the 23rd, and the 3rd uh, for JFK only. And obviously that was concerning to me as well with kids missing out on an additional three days. Um, so we tried to find a compromise um, that best suited the needs of the construction process and the moving process. And essentially our kids would be missing, JFK students would be still meeting their legal obligation of 180 school days, um, but really only missing that one additional day because of construction. And it's not uncommon. Um, I know that there's a gentleman sitting next to me who lived through this at Enfield High School. Um, and I, I am sure he'll be more than happy to share his stories from that period of time. Um, but we actually had to almost had to request waivers from the state based on the construction process at that point. So by getting away with 180 days with students being in a building for a construction project is, um, I think, is a, is a pretty good compromise on our part. All right. Thank you for explaining. Anyone else? Mr. Hamry? Uh, just one quick question. Um, is there any projected any possibilities that there'd be another projected need to affect the school schedule at all nope <laughs> um no that part i mean i i say that tongue-in-cheek the, the reality is you don't know um, especially with a construction project you know for instance there was at one point during the summer um, a series of storms came through with a roof that wasn't fully attached so that set them back a little bit if students were in the building then we probably wouldn't have been there um, but right now there's nothing anticipated outside of this setting the calendar here um, and getting all of the moving parts in the right places so that we can with any luck open maybe sooner than we originally anticipated thank you okay so i can go ahead and make a motion okay I make a motion that Wednesday, December 22nd, we will dismiss JFK students only at 11 a.m. No lunch will be served. Thursday, December 23rd is a planned K through 12 early release day with lunch. And Monday, January 3rd, JFK students only will not attend school. Second. Second. Okay, first. First. Oh, first. and then the fourth would. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, board members will need to waive the 181st day for JFK students only. So I need a first. First. Second. Motion by Mr. Hamry, seconded by Ms. Pickett. Roll call. Dr. Kalman. Aye. Mrs. Cushman. Yes. Mr. Hamry. Yes. Mr. LeBlanc. Yes. 
Mrs. Pickett? Yes. Mr. Ryder? Yes. Mr. Ungeyer? Four. Mrs. Acree? Yes. Madam Chair? Yes. Motion passes. Next item, board committee reports. Uh, we'll start with curriculum. Awesome. So we met. Woohoo. Um, and I just want to say how impressed um, with our school staff and leaders who came and um, supported our curriculum team around some program of study changes. So we did approve program of study changes. Um, we will be adding the state mandated Black Latino Studies elective course next year um, and some exciting work happening there. Um, the high school mathematics, um, many revisions, uh, adjustments to course names, prerequisites, course progression adjustments. Um, and there's an addition of an exploratory health science and foundations of health science electives. Um, encourage all families to uh, discuss with their school counselors the program of studies for their student and excited to see the work uh, moving forward. Can I just add? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I went to the curriculum committee meeting and I thought it, I thought it was great. Um, at one of the, the classes they're offering are like two health science classes, and these are for students who don't necessarily want to have to spend a lot of time in college because there's so many certificate programs that our community colleges offer. And so they're adding these two half credit courses for um, kids at Enfield High to take some exploratory health sciences. So th that was good news. Uh, the next committee is finance. Yes, uh, for certification of expenditures, uh, the finance committee met. No, on. we will we'll do that, um, Dr. Jerry, on item item fourteen. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's okay. I think uh, the one issue that came up at the finance committee, if I may mention it now, is the tag program. Um, the, the the tag or the talented and gifted program is uh, a gift from the estate of Abraham uh, Simkovitz to support projects developed by students uh, of extraordinary abilities. Uh, the students are selected to conduct research projects uh, yearly, and the budget is set at about $100,000 per year. It's subject to revision, but it can never exceed the interest on the TAG investment on the principal. Uh, we have never had occasion to revisit this program, and I think it's probably time, we think, the whole committee thinks, it is time to do so. Uh, the Finance and Budget Committee will meet at our next scheduled meeting with the investment company responsible for managing the TAG account, uh, which is Wolf Financial Group. At that time, we will discuss how much money is in the account and uh, how much of its interest we can spend on a yearly basis. Uh, this will really only be the beginning of the process. The Finance and Budget Committee will have to work with the Curriculum Committee and the Policy Committee on addressing how the program can be improved or expanded uh, in light of uh, available funding. So some of the specific questions that will need to be addressed are, should the project be limited to JFK? Um, how should student eligibility be determined? And uh, should expenditures be limited to one project uh, per year only? Thank you. Policy committee? Uh, policy also met last week, uh, meeting again uh, January 19th. Um, this week we, I'm sorry, last week when we met, um, <laughs> we finalized um, a series of policies that the board will receive at our next regularly scheduled meeting for our first reading. Um, the basis of the changes came out of legislation changes made last June um, down in Hartford. Um, they were all just legalese. Uh, an additional legal note may have been added to the bottom of the policy. Some wording within the policy may have changed due to the changes in the law, in the, in the state education law that it was speaking to. Um, other than that, it was pretty cut and dry on, on those, it was just a handful of them. And then we received the balance of those last June law changing policies. Uh, so there's another six or seven we'll be discussing in January. Um, we went over them very briefly with Mr. Longy, uh, just looked at titles, which ones are mandatory, which ones we had um, some latitude on. Um, and then there was a couple policy numbers that came up um, from one of our members that we we're going to look further into in January as well. Um, other than that, a uh, good first meeting of the, of the term and on to the next one, January 19th. <laughs> 
leadership. Uh, we had a meeting scheduled that we had to cancel, but we'll be putting some of those on the calendar. Uh, joint facilities, um, those are going to resume after the first of the year. JFK Building Committee. So I attended the JFK Building Committee as one of our Board of Ed liaisons. Uh, this was a week and a half ago. Uh, the meeting again this Thursday uh, at the meeting that I was at a uh, week and a half ago. Uh, we got to see some more images, some more of the progress that has been made in recent months. Um, there'll be a new updated PowerPoint brought to all of our attention probably in the spring, um, but it is available if you check their Facebook page uh, for the JFK Building Committee. Um, you can see the presentation that we saw as committee members a couple weeks back. And again, we are scheduled to meet this week on Thursday, um, but if there's no pressing business, that may get postponed until after the first of the year. Joint Security Committee. Uh, we had a meeting that was canceled, I believe, uh, two Wednesdays ago. Um, the next one scheduled is March 2nd, but I assume we'll meet prior to that. But that was the only official date I could find. The Joint Insurance Committee is slated to meet in March of 2022. Jean, I believe you're on that insurance committee with me, so I'll make sure that you get that information. Youth Mental Health and Wellness Advisory Committee. Okay, item 13, approval of the minutes. I believe we have to table this item uh, due to a glitch with the electronic glitch, really. Do we need to make a motion to do that? Or we could just say, so we're gonna table those uh, regular Board of Ed meeting minutes. Um, next, we move on to the approval of accounts and payroll, which Dr. Kalman will read. <laughs> All right, please excuse me. <laughs> Okay, so first the certification of expenditures. Uh, the Finance Committee met on December 6, 2021 to review financial statements for the month of October year to date and to examine various documents related to finances. So our review concluded that there is nothing significant to report to the board. So the motion is I move we accept the superintendent certification as follows. I hereby certify that in the month of October, total expenditures amount to $6,044,169.85. Uh, broken down between payroll totaling $4,468,442.10 and other accounts totaling $1,575,727.75. All payments have been made in accordance with the approved budget and are properly accounted for within the books of account. Copies of approval for check invoices are properly documented. And certified Lorena Cisneros, business manager. Moved. Yeah, seconded by Mr. Link. Motion by Ms. Pickett, seconded by Mr. LeBlanc. All in favor? Okay, certification of grants and Head Start expenditures. Uh, the Finance Committee met on December 6, 2021 to review financial statements for grants during the month of October uh, year to date and to examine various documents related to finances. Our review concluded that there is nothing significant to report to the board. And the motion is I move we accept the superintendent's certification as follows. I hereby certify that in the month of October, the total grant and Head Start expenditures amount to $721,237.24, broken down between payroll to totaling $466,968.19 and other accounts totaling $254,269.05. All payments have been made in accordance with the approved budget and are properly accounted for within the books of accounts. Copies of approval for check invoices are properly documented. Certified Lorena Cisneros, business manager. Motion, do I have a motion? Second. Was that, did you move? No, I can't Sorry. move. I, I move. <laughs> motion by Ms. Pickett, seconded by Mr. <laughs> Mr. Hamry. You can't move. All, okay. All in favor? <laughs> Correspondence and communications. There is none. Do we have a need for executive session? Underline, underline, underline. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion by Mr. Hamry. Second. Second by Mr. Ryder. Yeah. We are adjourned. I got one. <laughs>